Hello, Light Church at Home. We are so excited that you've decided to join us today. Whether you're watching with your friends, family, in your dorm room, welcome. This is church now. Kind of weird, but we are so excited that you have uh, decided to watch and be a part of our community. Yeah, before we get into worship, um, everything that you need to know about Light Church, you're going to find it at www.lightsandiego.com. We have connect cards that you can fill out. We also have prayer requests and praise reports. We know this is a crazy time, um, but we want to be praying with you and then also celebrating with you when we see those prayers being answered. Um, if you are looking for a place to tie, there is a tab for that as well. Um, and now it's time to worship. So if we would prepare our hearts and let's get ready to worship.
The last couple of weeks, we've been journeying through a letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians, a church in a little town called Colossae, about a hundred miles east of Ephesus. And as he writes to them, he is addressing the pressure and the threats that are coming against this new thriving church. Uh, primarily these, uh, these different ways of thinking that are trying to seduce them away from the purity and the profoundness of the gospel. And so Paul, as he sits in prison, writes to them with his overarching theme of the greatness of Jesus. As a matter of fact, last week we studied a portion of the beginning of the letter that's a hymn or a poem that he recites to this church describing the preeminence of Jesus Christ. In this section of the letter, the literary uh, function changes from speaking about Jesus to speaking to the Colossians. So what do we do because of the greatness of Jesus? What's our response? In today's teaching, the, over, the general theme or the overarching theme is that Jesus is worth it. Last week we talked about the greatness of Jesus and because of the greatness of Jesus, we know that in our lives, in the lives of the Colossians, in the lives of Light Church, in your life, following Jesus is worth it. And just because following Jesus is worth it does not mean that it's easy. And it's pretty easy to see here as we kind of conclude chapter one, that Paul here is not promising some sort of a successful life free of trials and suffering, but rather assigning purpose and depth to the middle of a life in the face of trials and in the face of suffering. So the very first thing that he says after he concludes this hymn, he says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to, pre to present you holy in his sight. I love this, without blemish and free from accusation. Um, Colossians 1, 21 through 22 might be one of the most condensed descriptions of the gospel ever. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It is, uh, this is your condition before God. Your relationship with him was severed. You were away um, from who you were always designed to be with, from your creator. And as a result of this, your mind was hostile towards God and it manifested itself in your evil behavior. That your lack of belief in God, this absence from him created a lifestyle and a series of behaviors that were broken, that were harmful. And then comes this incredible uh, change in verse 22 says, but now, present tense, he has reconciled you. Remember this idea of bringing back into order you by Christ's physical body. And again, he's addressing this heresy that was saying that Christ wasn't a physical body. You just appeared to be a physical body. So Paul wants to make sure not to believe uh, this Gnostic heresy. No, no, no. Jesus Christ was a real person. He died a real death and he raised with his physical body. And there's through his death to present you holy in his sight. And he, so here he just, again, just this 30,000 foot view of the gospel. It says, without blemish and free from accusation. So our posture before this great, mighty, preeminent Jesus Christ is without accusations. It's blameless. We get to stand before God as righteous. In another letter it describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 how Jesus Christ became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so this is what Paul describes him. He, he again he goes from this hymn and then he says, for you, don't forget. This is who you were, but this is who you are now because of what Jesus has done. Just describing the beauty of the gospel. And, and I, uh, I, I think of it it's interesting how the Christian faith is really unique in that every single uh, faith, uh, kind of faith ideology, whether it's a world religion or whether you think you're an atheist and that's your faith, uh, we all have this end goal in mind. But it's within the Christian faith that the finishing line 
is where we begin. We start at the end. Because of the cross, in Jesus' words and his dying breath, it is finished. We don't begin our relationship with God at square one. We don't begin our relationship with God at the starting line. We begin our relationship with God at the finish line. And then we move forward. Uh, I'm recording this video with my good friend Aaron on a Monday. Um, you're probably watching this on a Sunday or soon after that. So there's a whole week that's going by. And this week, um, I'm going to attempt to accomplish something I've never done before. On Friday, I'm scheduled to run a marathon. And obviously, there's no marathons going on right now. So by marathon, I mean I'm just going to run 26.2 miles. Uh, I've been training for this for a year. I thought I was going to do it in the spring. That didn't happen. I thought I was going to do it in the fall. I got a stress fracture in my shin. I wasn't able to uh, train anymore. And so since November, I've been working my training back up and I'm finally there. So this Friday, the, the idea, the goal is that I would be running a full marathon. And if I don't complete it, I'm probably going to record a different sermon. <laughs> but if you're watching this, I probably completed a marathon, most likely. But as I'm charting out my marathon, because no one's doing it for me, I've circled, this is my finish line. I'm gonna be running from UCSD to Oceanside Harbor. I'm letting my wife and kids know, hey, if you wanna be there at the end, this is where I'm gonna be, this is my finish line. But what I love about the gospel is you start at the finish line. You're handed a medal, an award you didn't win, that Jesus won for you. And you get to wear that and the rest of your life thereafter is running in a way that you have already assurance of a victory, of a finality, not of your own work, not of your own merit, not of your own behavior, but because of what Jesus has done for you. It changes everything. And so he describes the gospel. Colossians, this is what you have. You were like this, but now you get to start at the finish line. This is the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then he says this, if, so here's the caveat, right? Because not like we're just handed a award through the gospel. There is a life to live. There is Jesus to follow. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, I love this. I love Paul's language here because he doesn't mince words, right? He's not just saying like, look at what Jesus has done for you. Now just sit back and relax. He says, no, if our response to the finished work of the cross means that we have to respond with not just faith, but faithfulness. We have to have a continued faith that fuels us. We have to stay the course throughout our life. And there's something energetic and inspiring about the beginning of that journey, but then there are these seasons in our life where that journey is hard. There's seasons of our, li of our life, like the dark night of the soul, maybe the loss of a loved one, uh, dealing with our own intellectual doubts, whatever that may be. And for that not to frighten us, but for us to realize that's a part of the journey, that we are called to stay the course of faith. When I go out running on Friday, um, I've only ran 18 miles and I have to run 26 miles. And so I've been talking to some different family members and friends who've done this before. And I have to, with me, bring a backpack filled with water and uh, enough nutrients to get, me through the, to get me through the race. I was just talking to my brother-in-law who completed an Ironman last summer. And he says, you need to get these salt tablets he says, because at a certain point, your body will begin to want to start to shut down. And so I'm learning about that this isn't something I can just go out and do. Now, maybe I could try and I could limp my way along, but if I want to do this well, I have to think about the pace I'm running, the fuel I'm putting in my body. And in the same way, Paul exhorts this church that because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, don't have a faith that burns out. Don't think that you can on your own willpower, your own strength, just be like, I got this. I'm going to go and run. No, no, you have to understand that what's required of us, our response to the gospel is an established, firm faith that we have a hope holding on to the gospel, not our own work. 
And if you remember a couple weeks ago, Paul says this actually multiple times in his letter, it's because of the, the strength of Christ, the mighty work of Christ that fuels us. But that has to be our demeanor. That has to be our posture. What are we putting into our soul? What are we feeding our spirit? How are we running in such a pace that we're not going to burn out by our own works and our own strength? Thirdly, he says that now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. Paul says this a lot and it's, it's kind of bothersome. It seems like he just really enjoys this whole suffering deal. It says, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I want to stop right there um, and just address like that's a strange verse. What do you mean what's lacking in Christ? Isn't it the finished work? And so there's, there's a couple things going on right here. Number one, the, this is not a, a gospel proclamation, but an eschatological proclamation, meaning that when the second coming comes, we know that there's going to be suffering that's had. And Paul is describing the suffering that he's absorbing at this moment is a part of that process. He's taking on this. Uh, second thing you need to know is that what's lacking Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, his body not being the body on the cross, his body meaning the church. So Paul is taking on suffering in Christ's body, which is the church. The church is lacking. And so Paul, by his suffering, is adding to the Colossians. And so again, not the main point I want, I want to make right now, but just if you're ever confused at that verse, that's what's going on there. Verse 25. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you in the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love that line which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, so here's, here's what's going on here in, in Paul's language. He's saying, I'm sitting here in prison. I've been beaten. I've been whipped. I've been within an inch of my life. And I'm doing this and I'm rejoicing. I'm rejoicing because my suffering is adding something to you. He begins to start talking about this idea of what's, what's keeping him going, what's fueling, right? What's on that marathon, the RX bar, the water, this all, what's keeping Paul going in the midst of his suffering is this glorious hope, the hope of glory. This whole series was titled after this idea of what is this hope of glory that actually gives Paul joy in the midst of his suffering. And it's this, it's that Christ is in you. Now, I, I've always read that thinking that Paul's joy was experienced by Christ in him. But what I've also realized is that Paul's joy is not only Christ in him, it's Christ in the Colossians. The hope of glory is Christ in you, He's speaking to another group of people. His joy is not only that Christ lives within him, but that Christ lives within the Colossians. And that has so spoken to me this week is that there would be something of the greatness of Jesus, that Christ is in us, that it would stir us into live a life, even if that means ridicule or persecution, so that we would see other people be able to access that hope of glory, that promise that Christ can be in them when they recognize and bow the knee of their heart to His Lordship. And I just think about what the alternative of our faith being that somehow Christ is somewhere else. Christ is somewhere removed. He's somewhere in the heavenlies. And that it's, it's inspiring, yet we have something so much more rich. Christ in you. So I, I just wanted to just pause just for a moment. I want you to think about wherever you are watching this right now, I think rain's in the forecast. Maybe you're sitting this on your couch and it's raining or it had been raining. Uh, maybe you're just sitting in, in, your, in your dorm room or maybe you're listening to this while you're driving. I, just for a moment, wherever you are, do you realize that Christ, the same Christ we talk about who is preeminent, God over all, creator of the universe, 
dwells within you. He is the fuel that Paul just describes. This gives me joy in the midst of my suffering because it's so meaningful to me that even if I'm suffering, I know that my suffering is producing and furthering this message, the hope of glory, Christ in you. Lastly, in this, as this chapter ends, he says, in he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone, I love this, fully mature in Christ. So Paul's not just trying to remind them of the gospel. He's not just saying, hey, don't forget what I told you. He's saying the reason I'm writing you, the reason I'm still continuing to fight for you to not waver, for you to have a, a staying faith is this, is that you would be able to understand that the goal is that you'd be fully mature in Christ. Paul's not satisfied with their infancy. Paul's not satisfied with them just learning something and stopping. There is a progression, a sanctification, a maturity that he is longing to be able to be stirred within them as they move towards Christ. The Greek word mature is the Greek word teleon, which means attaining an end or a purpose. Now we talked about how the the marathon of faith we're running begins at the finish line, but that doesn't mean there's not an end goal. And the end goal for Paul right here is Christian maturity. But what's Christian maturity? What, what is this thing that he's alluding to? And we'll get to it later on in the book, the life that he's calling people to live. But he uses this language in 1 Corinthians 13, right after he describes the, the beauty and the profound nature of God's love. And he says this, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I think a lot of times that that verse, when I've heard it, has been taken out of the context. The context is love. Putting away childish ways and maturing into this new way of, of longing to fully know, even as we are fully known, and the three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these. And I think the greatest ideal we can have in our mind of what Christian maturity looks like is love this marathon of faith that begins at the finish line of the gospel is fueled by Christ in us, is pointing towards an end goal of us maturing into people of love. That's our end goal, that we are continuing by the Spirit of God to be changed and transformed into Christ's image. And we know that the image of Christ, the fullness of God, according to 1 John chapter 4, is that God is love. When we become like Jesus, we will become people of love. And so as Paul ends this, this section, again, there's much more to this letter, I just want to encourage you that on Friday when I'm running a marathon, I, I want to use that time to think about my spirituality, about my walk with Jesus, and to realize whether I'm feeling pain, exhaustion, a mental battle when I hit the wall. I know that there's something I'm running towards. And Paul is, is beseeching the church. I am not satisfied just with the fact that you know the beauty and the incredible gift of the gospel. You are to continue to mature into people of love, fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Who works the power? Christ. If you feel exhausted, draw your strength from Jesus. Don't give up. And don't just think you need to do better or work harder. Draw from His strength. Continue to run towards Him. Let's respond with faith because the greatness of Jesus means that He's always worth it. 
Father, we thank you for this moment. Lord, many of us feeling physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially just exhausted. But Lord, our, our race isn't through 2020 and 2021. Our, our, we run a different race. Lord, we start from a different point. We start from a finish line of the finished work of Christ and we are running towards becoming people of love. Love defined by you. And Jesus, I pray for anyone right now who's exhausted and weary. Lord, I pray that they would come to you because you will give them rest for their souls. Strengthen them now, Lord, as we step into a moment of worship. Would you meet with every one of us? Remind us that it is you, the hope of glory. God, that we have you in us us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there. Take me there if what you need is just an offering It's right here, my life is here And I'll be a living a sacrifice for you You're a fire, the refiner I want to be consumed I want to be tried by Take whatever you desire Lord is my life I want to be tried by fire And purified You take whatever you desire And Lord is my life If your glory wants to come
Thank you so much for watching today. Um, we can't wait to be together with those who are feeling comfortable gathering next Sunday, um, as long as weather's permitting. Um, but whether you're a part of our online community or in-person community, this is one family. And we want you to know that we love you. We're so glad that you belong. If there's anything we can do to pray for you, if there's anything we can do to support you, please don't hesitate to reach out. We love you guys and praying for you on this journey. Have an amazing week. Grace and peace.